Hi, everybody. Uh, we will go ahead and get started, if that's okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead. It's with great privilege that I get to introduce our graduating PGY5 Chief President, Dr. Erica Chandler. Uh, Erica has been with us for a really long time, graduating from Emory for college and neuroscience here for medical school, and then luckily is going to be joining us on faculty next year. Uh, she has a number of interests, including critical care neurology, but also really enjoys infectious disease. And so I'm excited to hear her talk today about infectious disease of the spinal cord. All right. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the objectives for our talk today are to review the pathophysiology, epidemiology, clinical manifestations, laboratory and imaging findings, as well as some treatment and outcomes of various infectious diseases of the spinal cord. So you might think, why is this important for neurologists? Um, over the past several years, there have been an increasing, um, there's been increasing use of immunomodulatory and immunosuppressive medications and increasing world travel in a post-pandemic world which has contributed to increased rates of more rare infections, um, particularly that may affect the spinal cord. So we will review common bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic infections, but we will not be reviewing meningitis, epidural abscesses, or spondylodiscitis. <clears throat> to understand infectious diseases of the spinal cord, it's important to understand that infection can occur via different mechanisms. The first being direct invasion of the nerves, nerve roots or the spinal cord itself. There can also be compression secondary to epidural abscess, osteomyelitis, or spondylodiscitis, just to name a couple, or there can be infarction due to infectious, infectious vasculitis. I really like this picture. Um, I took it from the Continuum articles. Um, it provides a good vis visualization of various anatomic localizations or locations and tropisms for different infectious organisms. We'll not talk about each of them specifically in detail, but I do think it's helpful in order to establish kind of a frame of reference when considering different infections. And of course, the clinical manifestation of these infectious diseases depends upon the anatomic location and the extent of disease. So the majority of this talk will focus on anatomic localization with spinal cord syndromes caused by different infections. And I hope that by focusing mostly on anatomy and clinical exam, we can ultimately create differentials of infectious organisms based on the patient's clinical exam. So we'll talk about spinal meningitis or arachnoiditis, anterior horn syndrome, central cord syndrome, <clears throat> anterior cord syndrome, dorsal column syndrome, um, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, dorsolateral syndrome, and um, cauda equina conus medullaris syndrome. So spinal meningitis or arachnoiditis, I don't think we think about this very commonly, um, but it's a process that causes direct inflammation of the leptomeninges of the spinal cord and nerve roots. In addition to infectious etiologies, there are also non-infectious causes such as sarcoid, leptomeningeal metastases, and post-surgical adhesive arachnoiditis. So as I mentioned, um, by definition, it is direct inflammation of the leptomeninges, and there are infectious and non-infectious causes. Patients may present with a sharp shooting pain that follows a specific, specific dermatomal distribution, and they may have focal weakness or numbness in a radicular distribution. They may or may not have bowel or bladder dysfunction, depending on the extent of disease, and typically um, it occurs over hours to days, but some presentations caused by TB, for example, can be more chronic in presentation. On exam, um, these patients may have pain or sensory changes in the dermatomal distribution and mild weakness in a dermatomal distribution as well. In terms of diagnosis, MRI with and without contrast may be normal early on in the disease, but later may show some leptomeningeal enhancement. Aside from enhancement, there can also be thickening of the cord surface, thickening of the nerve roots and cauda equina, and there can be even pockets of CSF or pus that develop in the late stages of infection. Oops, sorry. Um, the CSF profile mainly depends on what type of organism causes it, whether it's bacterial, fungal, or viral in nature. 
So the first disease that we'll talk about that causes a spinal meningitis or arachnoiditis is um, Lyme disease or neuroborreliosis. And this is a tick-borne infection caused by Borrelia spirochetes, <clears throat> usually Borrelia burgdorferi. Neurologic complications of Lyme disease occur in about 3 to 12% of patients in the U.S. and Europe, and it can affect both the central and peripheral nervous system. It's endemic primarily in the Northeast, North Central, and Northwestern United States, um, but there are kind of three different stages that we want to think about. There's early localized disease, early disseminated disease, and this occurs weeks after the initial infection. Most neurologic complications occur during early disseminated disease, and patients can have a cranial nerve palsy or neuritis, meningitis, or a radiculoneuritis. Rarely, um, Lyme disease can cause a transverse myelitis of the spine, um, but it is important to remember that during this early disseminated disease, that's when you get the classic erythema migraines rash. And then there's also late disease. <clears throat> the Lyme radiculoneuritis specifically is present in about 3% of CDC verified cases of Lyme disease. And it's probably more prevalent than that because there are likely several patients that don't have diagnosed Lyme disease. It typically presents fairly early in the disease course within weeks to months of the initial infection. And patients will have a sharp shooting pain that occurs um, in multiple nerve root distributions, and it can show kind of a migrating pattern. There's also associated sensory deficits, um, motor weakness, and they may have some reflex changes. And clinically, their exam may actually mimic a herniated disc. Um, um, if Lyme radicular neuritis is left untreated, these patients can go on to develop a migrating pain syndrome and focal signs of a radiculopathy. They can also develop a lymphocytic meningitis. In terms of imaging and diagnosis, the MRI is usually not very helpful because it may or may not show nerve root enhancement, but CSF is more telling. The CSF will typically show a lymphocytic pleocytosis, um, but higher suspicion for Lyme disease is raised if there's positive intrathecal production of Borrelia antibodies. Um, but Borrelia antibodies actually can be passively transferred from the serum to the CSF. So the presence of CSF ant antibodies does not necessarily indicate a CNS infection. There is actually a specific ratio um, or formula that um, we use to determine the ratio of um, serum to CSF antibodies in order to determine if it's actually a CNS infection. The treatment consists of oral doxy, IV penicillin, ceftriaxone, or cefotaxime. Pain typically improves after a therapy. However, some patients do spontaneously resolve months after the initial infection without ever receiving therapy. And some papers and studies propose that in patients with polyradicular signs and symptoms, Lyme disease should be considered, um, particularly in endemic regions, at the right time of the year, including spring through autumn, when you know people are outside and ticks are more active. Next is CMV. Um, typically, we don't worry about CMV infections in immunocompetent people, um, but in immunosuppressed patients, CMV infection can cause um, an encephalitis, a myelitis, or radiculitis. In terms of the symptoms associated with radiculoneuritis, patients may have weakness in a particular dermatomal distribution, um, decreased or absent reflexes, and they may have um, bowel or bladder dysfunction. CSF will typically show either a neutrophilic or a lymphocytic pleocytosis, as well as a low glucose. And if there is concern about CMV um, or you know, a patient being immunocompromised, CMV PCR should be obtained from the CSF in order to confirm the diagnosis. Similar to Lyme disease, MRI may show nerve root thickening, um, but it may not be particularly useful if it's normal. Treatment is targeted um, based on the severity of the disease. So for patients that have multisystemic involvement of CMV, including retinitis, myelitis, colitis, um, <clears throat> they are treated with dual therapy with um, vancyclovir and foscarnet. And then with patients with less severe disease, um, not involving you know, multisystem uh, problems, they are treated with oral uh, valgancyclovir. Um, and so before we delve into diseases that directly affect the spinal cord and not just the meninges, I wanted to highlight the difference between myelopathy and myelitis. So myelopathy, by definition, is spinal cord dysfunction of any etiology, um, whereas myelitis is inflammation of the spinal cord parenchyma by either infectious or non-infectious causes. So not all myelopathies are myelitis. Um, myelitis can also present in 
isolation is just a myelitis by itself, or it can present with encephalo encephalitis or radiculitis. So when interviewing patients or obtaining a history and attempting to determine if a myelitis is para or post-infectious, it's important to determine if there were preceding symptoms such as fever, chills, myalgias, URI symptoms, a recent GI illness, exposure to specific pathogens through travel um, or other contact. By definition, a para-infectious myelitis occurs when symptoms are present concurrently with the diagnosed um, infection, but a post-infectious myelitis occurs when symptoms are present after an infection. So infectious myelitis can occur in a, via a variety of mechanisms. For bacteria, infection may develop due to hematologic seeding of the CSF or spinal cord from direct instrumentation or trauma, or via seeding from systemic infections. Viral infections are actually a bit more interesting. They have um, a variety of mechanisms through which they can cause infection. Um, hematologic dis dissemination is pretty common, but other viruses are more creative with how they enter the CNS. So so HIV, for example, can invade host white blood cells and enter the CNS. HSV invades the CNS via the olfactory nerve. Rabies and poliovirus are suspected to travel via retrograde axonal transport. And then HTLV1 and West Nile virus are known to directly invade microvascular endothelial cells. So now we'll kind of go through each spinal cord syndrome with the associated infections to develop um, a broad differential. <clears throat> and we'll start with anterior horn syndrome. So anterior horn syndrome presents typically with a lower motor neuron pattern of flaccid weakness with absent or decreased deep tendon reflexes. It is important to note that on exam, these patients will have preservation of sensory modalities because it is usually just the anterior um, horn motor neurons that are primarily affected. Some of the most common viruses that cause an anterior horn syndrome are enteroviruses, Coxsackie viruses, echoviruses, polio and flaviviruses, and some tick-borne diseases as well. So the diagnostic criteria for AFM include core clinical features of weakness with decreased DTRs and decreased tone, an MRI with gray matter predominant lesions with or without nerve root enhancement, and CSF pleocytosis. A diagnosis of probable anterior horn syndrome just requires the first two criteria, but the CSF pleocytosis is not required. And this is a patient that we had earlier this year that um, we diagnosed with acute, acute flaccid myelitis. And you can see that there is primarily gray matter hyperintensities. Treatment for AFM includes IVIG if it's detected early in the disease course, but other immunomodulatory agents like steroids or plex have also been useful if there's a significant amount of cord edema. So the enteroviruses are a pretty well-known cause of AFM, particularly um, A71 and D68. Stereotypes. Um, in 2018, there was an outbreak of AFM in Colorado related to enterovirus A71. All of the children in this cohort had fever. Uh, many had lesions that, that appeared consistent with hand, foot, and mouth disease. And this occurred just prior to them developing neurologic symptoms. They presented primarily with weakness, myoclonus ataxia, some autonomic instability, and um, enterovirus specific, A71 specifically has more autonomic instability when compared to other enteroviruses. In terms of diagnosis, only about 20% of the cases had enterovirus detected in the CSF, um, but 79% had positive oropharyngeal swabs and 94% had positive stool samples, which just highlights the need that we take samples from other places besides the CSF, if you have a clinical concern for AFM. <clears throat> Um, Intravirus D68 is also a cause of AFM. There was a peak incidence of D68 infections in 2014, 16, and 18. And so that's an increased associated um, incidence of AFM with these infections as well. The patients with D68 typically had the typical anterior horn syndrome symptoms, but genomically, intravirus D68 is more similar to rhinovirus. So these patients typically had more um, upper respiratory illnesses prior to the onset of their neurologic symptoms. And additionally, when these patients were tested, it was more common to be found in respiratory samples than the stool samples, um, like we discussed in intervirus A70, or um, yeah, A71. Um, next, we'll talk about polio. Polio is no longer a significant public health threat thanks to eradication efforts, um, but it does still occur in areas of the world with endemic wild type poliovirus transmission, and they're very rare um, oral polio vaccine associated cases. So infection with polio occurs after fecal oral transmission, but it's not entirely understood 
how it gets into the CNS. Although there is some theories that it may uh, be through retrograde axonal transport or it may directly pass through the blood brain barrier. But once it does get into the CNS, we know that it has a specific tropism for the spinal um, motor neurons and anterior horn cells. Polio can cause either non-paralytic polio or paralytic polio disease. Um, prior to either of these um, diseases, patients typically have fever, headaches, sore throat, and fatigue. Um, but non-paralytic polio is a severe polio illness that lacks the motor weakness that we typically see in paralytic polio. These patients have fever and headache, but can also have vomiting and meningismus. If an LP is performed, um, the CSF will typically show moderate pleocytosis and elevated protein. This disease can be self-limited and resolved within a couple of weeks, but it can also progress to paralytic polio. Paralytic polio is the syndrome that we typically think about of AFM um, with acute flaccid weakness and pain due to injury of the anterior horn cells. The classic presentation of these patients is an aseptic meningitis with acute flaccid weakness. And on exam, the patients with paralytic polio will typically have an asymmetric weakness that affects the proximal more than the distal muscles, and the legs may be more involved with the, with, than the arms. They'll have the decreased or absent DTRs, but they'll have retained under normal sensation. Weakness typically worsens over two to three days before they reach their nadir, but a small percentage of patients will also develop some bulbar weakness as well. In terms of recovery, <clears throat> motor recovery takes months and is usually incomplete with some degree of residual weakness. So there is a specific um, protocol for the diagnosis of polio now. As we mentioned earlier with AFM, um, samples should be obtained from places outside of the CSF. So two stool samples should be obtained at least 24 hours apart during the first 14 days. And then in the CSF, um, there's a typically a neutrophilic pleocytosis that later shifts to a lymphocytic pleocytosis, and there's often elevated protein. Viral PCR from the pol uh, polio from the CSF can be sent, but it's positive in less than 30% of cases. And then as with the stool, similar to the stool samples, there is also a recommendation that two samples from the oropharynx be obtained at least 24 hours apart in the first 14 days. Um, in terms of other workup, if you are able to obtain an MRI, there may or may not be T2 hyperintensities in the spinal gray matter and or lower brainstem. Um, and really the MRI is useful to detect for detecting the degree of spinal cord inflammation. Um, you can also do an EMG depending on where you are in the course of disease. It may show low CMAPs, normal or mildly slow conduction velocities, and there's typically normal um, sensory studies. Treatment for polio um, is primarily supportive and includes pain management, PT, monitoring their respiratory status and cardiovascular status, monitoring blood pressure, and signs of autonomic dysfunction. Motor recovery, like I said, typically occurs over months and is often incomplete. And then there is a post-polio syndrome that may occur decades after the initial infection and can occur in up to 50% of poliomyelitis cases. Patients may present with progressive muscle weakness, respiratory insufficiency, dysphagia, pain, fatigue, and restless leg syndrome. Again, the treatment is primarily supportive, but there have been some case studies that suggest the use of IVIG for these patients. The next virus that can cause an anterior horn syndrome is West Nile. Um, this is an arbovirus that's transmitted by mosquitoes, typically in the late spring, summer, and early fall. There's a high incidence in the Dakotas, Nebraska, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, Louisiana, Mississippi, but has been reported in other states as well. <clears throat> Most of the time, patients infected with West Nile are actually asymptomatic, but about 25% of people will develop um, systemic symptoms with fever, headache, rash, myalgias, back pain, um, and a poor appetite. And then a small percentage of that population um, will go on to develop neuroinvasive disease. Risk factors for neuroinvasive disease include older age, malignancy, and immunosuppressed status. Um, West Nile can cause a meningitis or a meningoencephalitis or a myelitis or a combination of all three. If it causes a myelitis, it is typically an acute flaccid myelitis with weakness, decreased DTRs, and possible bowel and bladder dysfunction but it also has a specific tropism for the deep gray matter of the brain. So these patients may also have extra pyramidal symptoms such as tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and myoclonus. <clears throat> um, of the patients that have neuroinvasive disease, about five to 10% of them will have the acute flaccid paralysis. These patients have asymmetric weakness um, that typically develops over 48 hours and it can occur with encephalitis or a meningitis.
On spinal imaging, there may be T2 hyperintensities of the ventral spinal cord and gray matter, or there may be a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. On the CSF, there is typically a neutrophilic pleocytosis early on that becomes a lymphocytic pleocytosis over time. And CSF IgM for West Nile virus is the most sensitive test because IgM cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So if there is intrathecal production of IgM, it's indicative of a CNS infection. However, IgM in the CSF can stay positive for months and is not useful in determining timing of infection. Um, and then in some patients that are immunocompromised, they may not be able to mount an appropriate antibody response. So you can obtain a, um, a PCR from the CSF as well. Treatment is typically supportive, although some centers do use IVIG. And then recovery for neuroinvasive disease, specifically AFM, um, occurs over months and is pretty unpredictable. About a third of patients will have complete recovery, a third will have incomplete recovery, and then a third just will fail to improve. So that was all anterior horn syndrome, and now we'll talk about anterior cord syndrome. Um, in anterior cord syndrome, the patient will present with weakness below the level of the lesion due to involvement of both the anterior horn cells as well as the lateral corticospinal tracts. In addition, there will be loss of pain and temperature sensation at and below the level of the lesion due to involvement of the spinal thalamic tracts. There will be preservation of vibration and proprioception as these are dorsal column modalities. In addition, patients may have back pain, autonomic dysfunction, and bowel or bladder dysfunction. And as part of the infectious etiology, this specific anterior cord syndrome is thought to be due to vascular injury or vasculitis that causes ischemic injury of the cord because the anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. So varicella zoster can cause multiple different types of CNS infections, um, including encephalitis, meningitis, cerebellitis, stroke, myelitis, and a peripheral neuritis. Um, it's relatively uncommon for it to cause a, more, a myelitis, but more common for it to cause a cerebellitis or encephalitis. However, if it does cause a myelitis, it does have a disposition to affect the anterior cord, um, which causes an anterior cord syndrome. Lisi B myelitis can be seen as part of the primary infection, but can actually occur later in disease as part of the reactivation process. And these patients will present with acute to subacute onset of weakness that is typically asymmetric. Um, there will be loss of pain and sensory or pain and temperature sensations, but dorsal column modalities are preserved. Um, and they may or may not have the typical vesicular rash and the dermatomal distribution that is um, associated with BCB. And as I mentioned, the patients can have myelitis, encephalitis, meningitis, or radiculitis, or some combination all of, of all of these at the time of diagnosis. BZB has a particular tropism for the dorsal root ganglion, where it lies dormant and then can reactivate years after the initial infection. In terms of causing the anterior horn syndrome specifically, it's thought that the varicella virus itself leads to an infectious vasculitis that affects the anterior spinal artery and thus causes the anterior horn syndrome. However, it can also cause direct damage to the spinal cord itself. <clears throat> CSF will typically show lymphocytic pleocytosis with elevated protein, and MRI may show diffusion restriction of the anterior horn or longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. If there's a rash or vesicles present, um, these can be sampled, um, and you can obtain a PCR from the fluid, but you can also obtain VZV PCR from the CSF, but IgG and IgM are thought to be more sensitive than the PCR. And then, of course, for treatment is typically a cyclovir. So next we'll talk about um, central cord syndrome. This is not specific to any particular infectious etiology, um, but I do think it's important to know the clinical syndrome. <clears throat> it can be seen with pyogenic abscesses and immune-mediated disorders. These patients, um, their presentation really depends on how extensive the lesion is. Um, generally, the spinal thalamic tract is involved and causes loss of pain and temperature sensation below the level of the lesion. But if lesions are large and extend more ventrally, it can cause ventral horn syndrome in the kind of the lower motor neuron pattern of injury. If they extend far enough, um, it can also involve the corticospinal tracts. Uh, but if these are involved, typically the arms will be more affected than the legs just due to the somatotopic organization of the corticospinal tracts. And lastly, fibers that control bowel and bladder function are typically located more medially. So these patients often have bowel and bladder dysfunction early in their disease course. Next is dorsal column syndrome. Um, this exam is similar to patients that have an epidural abscess that causes compression. 
On exam, these patients will have decreased or absent vibration and proprioception at and below the level of the lesions, and there's typically preserved strength and pain and temperature sensation. <clears throat> there are a few infectious causes of dorsal syndrome that we will get into, but there are also non-infectious causes to be aware of, such as B12 deficiency, vitamin E, copper deficiency, malignancy, spondylotic disease, and posterior spinal um, artery infarct. So syphilis is a classic infection that causes dorsal column syndrome. It's caused by the spiroquetal infection with treponema pallidum, and syphilis can cause spinal cord disease either early in the disease course as part of meningovascular syphilis or late in the disease course known as tabes dorsalis. Meningovascular syphilis occurs due to granulomatous inflammation and arteritis, um, and the infectious spirochete actually invades the blood vessels that supply the leptomeninges brain and spinal cord and presents with meningitis and strokes. Patients will have meningismus, headaches, as well as a slowly progressive spastic paraparesis that occurs over months, and there's typically sensory loss in the legs. It can be a subacute um, and slowly progressive process, but it can also present as a sudden or acute onset myelopathy secondary to the arteritis or ischemic infarct of the cord. Go back. <clears throat> Meningovascular syphilis can occur as early as one month into the disease, but as I mentioned, it can also occur very late in the disease as well. And then imaging will typically show a T2 hyperintensity with enhancement, plus or minus pachymeningeal enhancement of the cord. CSF usually shows lymphocytic pleocytosis. In contrast to meningovascular syphilis, TB dorsalis um, typically occurs late in the disease during tertiary syphilis, which is years after the primary infection. Patients may have other symptoms of late-stage syphilis, such as neuropsychiatric symptoms, aortitis, gamma formation in various locations. In the first stage of TB dorsalis, patients present with lancinating and sharp shooting pains that occur in a radicular distribution, <clears throat> and they're often sensitive to touch as touching painful areas may elicit a sharp shooting pain. They may or may not have abdominal pain and urinary dysfunction. On exam, they have loss of proprioception and a positive positive rhombar due to involvement of the dorsal columns, and they may have loss of deep pain sensation. They can also have absent reflexes in the argyle robertson pupil as well. On MRI, there may be T2 hyperintensities in the dorsal column, and CSF will show elevated protein, a lymphocytic pleocytosis, and positive VDRL. Ultimately, to make the diagnosis, you must have neurologic dysfunction consistent with neurosyphilis, positive serum, serum testing for syphilis, and CSF findings of inflammation. BDRL and RPR can be positive from the serum during active infection, but may be negative later on, which is typically when TB dorsalis presents. Therefore, it's also helpful to have the VDRL testing from the CSF. Treatment consists of penicillin or ceftriaxone, and if left untreated, these patients may go on to develop a sensory ataxic gait, persistent pain, and can actually lose ambulation. Next, we'll talk about um, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. By definition, this is spinal cord inflammation spanning three or more segments. And I know we've all seen this probably multiple times, secondary to multiple etiologies that we've listed here, but I'll just talk about a couple of different infections. Um, we won't talk about all of the infectious organisms, but one we haven't talked about yet is EBV. EBV causes infectious mononucleosis characterized by pharyngitis, cervical lymphadenopathy, fever and fatigue. However, it can also cause various CNS infections, such as encephalitis, myelitis, and myeloradiculitis. When the myelitis occurs, it is typically longitudinally extensive. And on imaging, there are central T2 hyperintensities, um, and it tends to affect the central cord more than other areas of the cord. CSF will show a mononuclear pleocytosis, um, and EBV PCR from the CSF may be positive, but as mentioned previously for other infections, it's important to obtain IgG and IgM antibodies as well to determine if there's actual intrathecal production. <clears throat> dorsal lateral syndrome, as the name implies, affects the dorsal and the lateral columns. Clinically, this causes a spastic paraparesis due to involvement of the lateral corticospinal tracts, as well as impaired proprioception, joint position sense, and vibration due to involvement of the dorsal columns. It's typically caused by chronic infectious myelopathy, such as HIV and HTLV-1. First, we'll talk about HTLV-1, which is also known as tropical spastic paraparesis. This is a human retrovirus that's associated with adult T-cell leukemia or lymphoma, as well as the HTLV-1-associated myelopathies. <clears throat> 
It's endemic in Southwest Japan, the Caribbean, South America, Africa, the Middle East, and Romania. And it can be transmitted in three ways. The first is vertical from mother to child and transmission rates are actually higher um, in breastfed babies compared to bottle fed babies. The second is through sexual transmission. And lastly, it can be transferred via blood products, but obviously the blood products in the US are screened appropriately for this. In terms of presentation, it is usually a slowly progressive spastic paraparesis that occurs over months to years, but patients are typically disabled by two years into the disease course. And there can be some variability in the disease progression. They may have bladder and erectile dysfunction, lower lumbar pain, and neuropathic pain in their legs. On exam, the patients are often weak with spasticity, hyperreflexia, and impaired proprioception in the legs. And prognosis is quite variable um, and depends on various factors, including age, the degree of HTLV1 proviral levels. Some patients are actually asymptomatic with only mild symptoms, but others can completely lose ambulation, and it doesn't seem to be that there are clear risk factors that predict your disease course. In order to make the diagnosis, you should have positive IgG antibodies in the serum and the CSF. However, in areas where the disease is endemic, serology alone is not enough to make the diagnosis. CSF typically shows a mild leukocytosis with normal to mildly elevated protein. MRI can show progressive atrophy of the cord, um, particularly the thoracic cord, and there may be two, T2 hyperintensities in the dorsal cord. The majority of demyelination and axonal loss and damage occurs in the thoracic cord, which is why you get the most, the most amount of atrophy there. But early in the disease course, um, the MRI can be normal. There are currently no targeted or specific therapies. Treatment is primarily supported with PT, exercise, pain management, and management of spasticity, as well as bowel and bladder function. But earlier in, early in the disease course, some patients have been treated with steroids, um, and there are some trials currently underway looking at the use of various antiretroviral therapies. <clears throat> HIV is a retrovirus that targets multiple cell types, including CD4 T cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and microglia. As we all know, HIV can affect the CS, CNS in many ways, but we'll focus on the vacuolar myelopathy as a manifestation of spinal cord disease. These patients pre present with chronic progressive lower extremity weakness, spasticity, and sensory loss that primarily affects dorsal column modalities. Um, in addition, they may have a sensory ataxia um, and bowel or bladder dysfunction. Overall, the presentation is similar to HTLV1, B12 deficiency, and copper deficiency. The pathogenesis is not not very well understood, but we do know that it's not a direct vir viral invasion of the spinal cord. On pathology, there is spongiform degeneration that affects the lateral and posterior columns with vacuoles and intravacuolar macrophages. And it actually has been found on autopsy of asymptomatic patients, which indicates that there is a degree of subclinical infection that occurs. The CSF is not particularly inflammatory, but the MRI may be normal or show cord atrophy with T2 hyperintensities without enhancement. And this is in contrast to HTLV1 where there is cord enhancement. For treatment, patients um, receive antiretroviral therapy, um, but there have also been some cases of using IVIG, but there are no controlled trials for this. HIV myelitis is also a manifestation of HIV-related spinal cord disease. In contrast to the vacuolar myelopathy with HIV myelitis, the pathogenesis is secondary to direct invasion of the spinal cord by the HIV virus itself. And as the name implies, HIV myelitis presents as more of an acute myelitis and tends to happen earlier in the disease course um, when the CD4 counts begin to fall, whereas the vacuolar myelopathy occurs later in the disease course and these patients have a more chronic presentation. Treatment consists of antiretroviral therapy, um, but it, in addition to HIV-related myelopathy or myelitis, um, this can also occur after antiretroviral anti therapy is started due to immune dysregulation as part of systemic immune reconstitution syndrome. And this specific syndrome is treated with steroids. And lastly, it is important to remember that in all patients that have HIV, once their CD4 counts begin to fall below 500, ultimately all these other diseases that we've talked about, they are at risk for that as well. <clears throat> and last, we'll talk about um, conus medullaris and cauda equina syndrome. So these can both present primarily with acute to subacute changes in bowel and bladder function, sensory changes in the lower extremities and perineum, and bilateral lower extremity weakness. 
we all have taken care of patients that have HSV and we've probably taken care of patients that have HSV encephalitis, but it can also cause meningitis, radiculitis, and amyelitis, as well as this conus medullaris syndrome. HSV 1 and 2 are both linear double-stranded DNA. After HSV causes a primary infection, it integrates into the cellular genome of the infected dorsal root ganglia, and then it can lie dormant there for years and reactivate periodically during times of immunosuppression. HSV-1 tends to cause more of an encephalitis, whereas HSV-2 tends to cause a recurrent meningitis or lumbosacral radiculomyelitis, and rarely HSV-2 can cause a necrotizing longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis that affects both the gray and the white matter. We'll focus most, mostly on the radiculomyelitis since we are talking about conus medullaris and cauda equina syndrome, and this radiculomyelitis can occur as part of primary infection or during reactivation. So HSV2 is the, is the virus that typically causes a radiculomyelitis and affects the conus medullaris and the lumbosacral dermatomes. These patients present with subacute onset of urinary retention, numbness or weakness in the legs, and may or may not have a vesicular rash present. On MRI, there's often T2 hyperintensities in the caudal spinal cord um, with smooth enlargement of the nerve roots. Nodular enhancement of the nerve roots typically indicates either malignancy or granulomatous disease, so these patients will usually have smooth nerve root enhancement. CSF early on can show a neutrophilic pleocytosis that later on transitions to a lymphocytic pleocytosis, and they do have elevated protein. HSV PCR from the CSF may be positive if tested in the first 3 to 14 days of symptom onset, but if outside of that window, it's more useful to obtain the IgG and IgM antibodies to indicate if there's any intrathecal synthesis. And then, of course, treatment consists of 10 to 14 days of IVA cyclovir. Another organism that can affect the conus and cauda equina is schistosomiasis. This is a parasitic infection that's endemic in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa. The larva actually penetrate the skin and then travel either hematogenously or via lymphatic spread to the portal circulation. And there in the liver, the males and females mate and release their eggs, and the eggs can stay in the liver or go to the spinal cord or other areas of the body. These patients can present with an acute myelitis or subacute myeloradiculopathy of the lumbosacral region, and the patients can have an itchy rash at the side of the larval entry and may actually have a systemic hypersensitivity reaction following hematogenous spread of the parasite. Neurologically, they can have lumbar pain, lower limb radicular pain, muscle weakness, sensory loss, and bladder dysfunction. <clears throat> For diagnostic testing, serum IgG and IgM may indicate that there is an infection, but this is not useful in endemic regions where prior infections are very common. So again, CSF, IgG, and IgM are useful because it does indicate um, that there is some intrathecal synthesis antibodies. You can also check the stool sample for parasites, but they may or may not be present. Um, and it's not very useful for people that have a low burden of disease because the parasite just may not be present. CF CSF testing will typically show a degree of eosinophilia, but this is not always present. And then MRI um, typically shows involvement of the caudal spinal cord and cauda equina with T2 hyperintensity and contrast enhancement of the spinal cord and nerve roots. If patients have neurologic syndrome and evidence that supports the diagnosis and evidence of systemic disease, they are treated with um, praziquantel and steroids for inflammation. However, sometimes um, surgical decompression is necessary to relieve um, you know, pressure from the spinal cord lesions. So in addition to all the syndromes we've talked about, um, there can also be uh, multifocal disease as well. Intramedullary abscesses are much more rare than epidural abscesses, but if present, they are frequently caused by either staph or strep species, and these abscesses actually tend to be more monomicrobial rather than polymicrobial, which is what we see in other types of abscesses. Patients that have intramedullary lesions can present with subacute onset of myelopathy, and they may or may not have fever or other um, associated systemic symptoms. In order to make the diagnosis, it may involve aspiration and biopsy in order to distinguish it from malignancy or neoplasm. And treatment consists of the appropriate antimicrobials, plus or minus aspiration, or they may just have um, uh, antimicrobials alone. But many patients are left with residual deficits from these um, abscesses. Um, Neurocystic psychosis typically causes cysts located throughout the brain parenchyma, but can also cause spinal cord disease as well. So this is caused by tinea solium, which is endemic to Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa and South America, um, and Southeast Asia. 
It's transmitted via fecal oral um, ingestion of the eggs or via undercooked pork. And once ingested, it can insist and remain in very, various tissues where it lies dormant for up to many years. As previously mentioned, when we think of neurosis or sarcosis, we think of scattered brain lesions or scattered cysts throughout the brain parenchyma. Um, and these patients typically present with seizures or focal neurologic deficits. However, it can cause the intermedullary cyst within the spinal cord as well. When this happens, patients will have focal motor deficits, radicular pain, and sensory issues um, from the spinal lesion, as well as a subacute or chronic myelopathy. And typically, these patients also have like brain parenchyma involvement as well. It's not typically just an isolated spinal disease. CSF will show an elevated protein and mononuclear pleocytosis, and MRI can show scattered cystic lesions, as you see here. Um, and if spinal imaging is, uh, or if spinal involvement is present, there is, like I said, typically brain parenchymal involvement as well. Treatment consists of albendazole and steroids, and they may or may not result, require um, surgical decompression of the spinal lesions as well. <clears throat> Toxo um, is another, um, another parasite that can cause um, scattered spinal cord lesions. Um, it's an obligate intracellular protozoan parasite, and usually patients are asymptomatic, but when they become immunocompromised, the cyst can reactivate or a primary infection can become detrimental. Patients most commonly have brain lesions, but similar to what we just said, spinal cord involvement can also occur simultaneously with uh, brain parenchymal involvement. Patients may have weakness, sensory loss, sphincter dysfunction, abnormal DTRs, and they may or may not have fever. The presentation overall is quite subacute in nature. CSF will show a mononuclear pleocytosis, normal glucose, and PCR may be positive for um, toxo. MRI may show contrast enhancement and T2 hyperintense lesions in the spinal cord. Um, Toxo specifically has a, a predilection for the um, thoracic cord, um, even though this picture is showing us the distal spinal cord. Um, and I, like I said, CSF Toxo PCR can be obtained in order to kind of solidify the diagnosis. Treatment consists of six weeks of sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine, as well as leucovorin in order to prevent hematologic toxicity of pyrimethamine, but Bactrim can also be used. And then lastly, I do just want to briefly touch on CNS infections caused by TB. Um, you could do an entire lecture on CNS manifestations of TB. It can cause meningitis, myelitis, spinal arachnoiditis, or tuberculomas of the CNS. So it can kind of cause all of these syndromes that we've talked about. Um, TB causes CNS infection primarily via hematogenous spread. Um, tuberculoma specifically can cause multifocal spinal cord lesions as well as multifocal parenchymal lesions. But there can also be rupture and spread of these uh, of TB infection, and it can spread throughout the subarachnoid space, which results in either meningitis or spinal arachnoiditis. TB myelitis can occur and is typically a longitudinally extensive process when it does happen. And then CSF of patients with TB typically shows the classic lymphocytic pleocytosis, high protein, low glucose. In addition to direct infection, it can cause also a vertebral osteomyelitis, which causes cord compression or myelopathy, and this is known as POTS disease. So just to recap, I do think this is an important topic because with the increasing um, immunomodulatory therapy and increasing world travel, we should be mindful of considering infections um, in our patient populations, both adult and pediatric. And based on the clinical presentation or spinal cord syndrome, the differential diagnosis can be narrowed to a subset of infectious organisms, which means as neurologists, we can almost localize to an infectious organism. <clears throat> so here are my references. And if anyone has any questions. Always. Uh, Most common infection, like, like a specific syndrome, you think? Um, I mean, I would say the most common infectious myelopathy is probably a viral. I don't know if there's one specific virus that is the most common, but I would say viral is by far the, most the bugs we talked about. And I think it depends on like time of year, location, like within the spinal cord, and their geographic location. 
And sometimes we don't ever find out, right? Like we think it's an infectious cause, but you know, they present with URI symptoms or their RPP is negative, but they have a myelitis at the same time, but you don't ever really know what bug caused it. Erica. Thanks for coming. Interesting. Hello, Erica. Hey guys. Uh, Dr. Puri here. Um, that was a uh, an absolutely fantastic talk. Uh, it was actually uh, it's a pretty complex uh, subject uh, to to talk about. So, Erica, um, can you uh, tell us? sort of you know the the negative yield of mri imaging in some of these you know conditions and especially when you see a mild uh, iteration of the issue uh you know you have negative mri and i guess the great value of careful history taking an exam and uh you know and the lumbar puncture in these patients Erica, are you there? Vinay, are you there? Yes, I'm here, waiting patiently. <laughs> I think we're, we might be alone. They might have abandoned us. Oh wow! Yeah, it, it looks like the the classroom participants uh, has left the conference, so she must have logged off the auditorium computer before uh, before he asked her question, Dr. Perry. Well, that's all right. Well, uh, that was really a, a great uh, you know talk. And uh, um, Martin, did you have any thoughts on you know MRI negative cases that you've seen? Uh, if it's a, if it was a case, then I have missed it. So I have, I have not recognized a case of MRI negative infectious disease. Uh, I mean, I can think of a handful of times when we've made a diagnosis of any of these, uh, infectious diseases. And it could be because, because I'm not looking, I'm not paying attention. Um, uh, it, where is Erica going to be in July? Um, Erica is, I think that uh, Erica probably finishes, a, uh, she will still be on on, uh, on child neurology during residency. I think because of her maternity leave, I don't know if her time is extended or whether she, or she or if she's done, uh, she may be um, taking a couple of months off possibly. Yeah, you know, oh, she'll yes. have some time off, but yes, yes. Right. residency is not extended. Well, I'm 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 going to uh, I'm going to try and uh, recruit her to give us one of the neuroemergency lecture series for infectious diseases uh, because we don't have that we haven't had that I try to get Forrest Arnold to give one and I don't know if there's anyone in infectious disease who's uh, interested in in neuro infectious diseases and and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that I can convince her to to be uh, available sometime in July uh, and and give a similar talk, but actually turn it around from uh, each infection presenting this way to the presentation and going backwards to the way that we see patients is uh, the presentation is first. Uh, the yeah, clinical oh, presentation. No, yeah, I, I imagine even if she's, uh, you know, traveling or globe trotting or whatever, she can still, uh, you know, it's virtual. Zoom, that's can, right. Yes, she yes, could be on a beach. Or virtual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you guys did a great job uh, getting her uh, 
uh, trained. So thank you. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, this is a great talk. She's on service actually right now. So she's multitasking. Her husband, <laughs> is, her husband is deployed right now in, you know, in Kuwait City. And, and so uh, she's doing a lot. And as you can see, she's a very organized <laughs> person. So that was a great talk. Yeah. Well, All everybody right. have a nice day, everybody. Take care. You too.